Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation. Uh, we've been looking at all sorts of issues over the last year or so in virtual mode. Um, many of them relate to green investment, to the ESG issues, in particular to the environment. Uh, most of them take as granted that uh, ESG issues are increasingly important in the investment world, and many of them argue that ESG funds, ESG investments outperform the, the, the general market. Um, there are, however, a few dissidents. Um, and some of the more interesting research has been done recently by Lauren Cohen and his colleagues at Harvard Business School. They have published recently a paper in the uh, National Bureau of Economic Research on uh, what they call the ESG innovation disconnect. I think it's a particularly fascinating paper. I will give you just the, uh, the final, the, the almost the concluding paragraph. We find, he says, we find consistent and robust markers that the quantity and quality of green patenting, that's green patenting, he's looking at uh, patents in the green area, for uh, is higher for energy firms. Paradoxically, these firms are precisely those to which capital is often restricted by mandate and campaigns where directive, whose directive is to solve the important problems linked to uh, green innovation. Our findings raise important questions as to whether the current exclusions of many ESG focused policies, along with the increasing incidence of explicit divestiture campaigns are optimal, or whether reward based incentives would lead to more to a more in efficient, innovative outcome. Um, Lauren is a professor of finance and innovation, the L.E. Simons Professor, Simmons Professor of, at, of Business Administration at Harvard. He's also a research associate at the MBER. Uh, he's a faculty co-chair of the Harvard X FinTech Center. He has six children. And the most amazing thing of all is that his hobby is powerlifting, I quote, a world-class amateur powerlifter. In 2014, he broke the all-time world record. Uh, he, he did his undergraduate at Wharton. Uh, he and Donald Trump both have an undergraduate degree from the University of Pennsylvania's Business School. Uh, but he's not going to get things all his own way. Leslie Gent is Managing Director and Head of Responsible Investment at Coots here in London, where she's been for almost 15 years. She's a Chartered Financial Analyst at the CFA Institute. She's a trustee of the Coots Foundation, and she was formerly a research associate many years ago at Charles Schwab in San Francisco. So uh, my colleague, Jane Fuller, who has a particular interest in, in, in these issues, and I will ask any questions should they need to be asked. But first of all, I give you a powerlifter extraordinaire, Harvard Business School professor, Lauren Cohen. Lauren, the floor is yours. So Andrew, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and for giving a broad overview of the paper. And so I'll kind of pick up where you left off, although you already gave a kind of nice overview of what we find. And that is that, um, look, the, the, the motivation is quite simple and it's one that you know well and, and is becoming really a tune that everyone knows well across the globe. And that is that the motivation of ESG, or, or, and I'll go into detail what each of these are, but the motivation that, hey, there's something else beside risk-adjusted returns that we care about is making its way into investing in a big way. And so what do I mean a big way? Well, look, uh, some statistics behind this are in the US, we have good data on this, that 20% of assets of our $46 trillion um, in AUM in the entire US are, has an ESG mandate and, and more than 40% and now closer to 50% of new assets coming in are pouring in to funds with mandates or managers with mandates. And so you can see that this is really something that people care about and seem to be caring about more and more. And so how is this done? Well, look, it's largely done in two ways. So the first is through a rating agency, such as Sustainalytics or Morningstar or S&P, that says that, hey, these firms have this type of ESG exposure and these firms have a different ESG rating. And secondly, through these divestiture campaigns, whereas an organization or an institution like Harvard University might say, hey, look, we're just not going to invest in any firm that operates in industry A, right, where A... Uh, is most often for industries like tobacco, weapons, or in the case we're going to look at in this paper, fossil fuels. 
right? So kind of keep both those in mind as ways to implement this strategy. Um, now look, there are lots of reasons why we might think that ESG strategies make sense. And so I'll give you kind of two of them. The first is a preference-based reason. It's that, hey, look, I just prefer to invest in a fund that is motivated by something other than risk-adjusted returns. And now uh, I totally understand that's true. And so I'm willing to take a lower risk-adjusted return in order for it to be achieved using the ESG motivation. Or secondly, I'm willing to pay a manager more because I know it's harder, right? If I restrict the investment universe, then getting that risk-adjusted return is just tougher to do. It's gonna take more searching, more processing. And so I'm totally happy to pay more to get the same level of risk adjusted return, right? That's preference based. But even if you don't have preferences for ESG at all, you might still think it's optimal to invest in an ESG way. And the reason is that you think the rest of the world values it. So if you say, gosh, I think firms and customers and employees really value ESG such that the best employees are going to go to ESG compliant firms or that customers want to buy goods from ESG compliant firms, then you might have a theory that those firms that will be the highest ESG rated really will be generating the most value in the future. And if you think the market isn't perfectly pricing that, then it's just the smart move to invest in ESG, even if you don't have a preference for it at all. Right Now, uh, Andrew mentioned the empirical evidence on this. And look, to be honest, the empirical evidence on this is mixed. Okay, It's frankly mixed. And the reason it's mixed is that this is a really hard problem to solve empirically. Because look, in many of our models where we have even stable means and standard deviations and then further moments of distributions, we need on the order of hundreds and even thousands of years to estimate differences in means, difference in expected returns among strategies. Whereas ESG, we've had like 15 or 20 years. It's just not nearly long enough for us to do that and to make these performance insensitive so, uh, uh, assessments, I should say. So within the asset management space, really kind of a push at this point. Some papers find that outperforms, some papers find that underperforms, and we can't really tell. And the same thing on the firm behavior side, right? And so that led us to this paper. And so what do I do here? Well, what we're going to do is take a lens that we have expertise in. So I have a research agenda that looks at innovation and in particular patents and how they affect innovation worldwide. Um, and so it takes that innovation lens and it says, gosh, let's just look at who's doing innovation in the green space. Right. And the reason that's so important is that the world agrees that we're not there yet. Look, we all want to get to that carbon neutral future, right? That future that is more climate sensitive, that, that starts to turn around the climate issues that we have, but we just don't have the technology to do that today. So innovation is gonna be an important part of anyone's solution to getting there. And so understanding who's doing the best innovation, right? And getting capital in those hands, well, that's the whole role of financial markets, right? One of the most important is connecting capital to the best ideas. And so we take a look at, gosh, who has had the best ideas in the past? And is that matching up with who's getting capital? Okay. And here's what we find. Um, we find that, like Andrew mentioned, a large fraction isn't driven by the people getting the most capital to do this. But in fact, the opposite. It's driven by the people who are being excluded from this market from a capital perspective. And they are the traditional energy sector. So they are both some of the largest producers of green patents, right? And at a firm level, the largest producers of the intensity of green patents, which is to say the percentage of, of their total patent portfolio going towards green innovation, right? And secondly, and most importantly, they're producing the highest value innovation, which is to say they're producing the innovation that is both the most valuable in terms of citations and is the most likely to generate blockbuster status. Blockbuster status is important because that's been tied to the most valuable goods in all industries over time, okay? And what's kind of odd in that sense is that not only are they the ones explicitly being excluded in divestiture campaigns, but they're also getting the lowest ESG ratings and the more green patenting they do, paradoxically, the lower ESG rating they get. 
But even though this is true, we wanted to push further because we said, God, what if they're just being strategic, right? What if these traditional energy firms are patenting, but they're doing it just to make those patents? And, and what a patent is, is it's, it's a legal contract, but a defensive legal contract. So if Andrew patents something, he doesn't have to produce anything with that patent, but it gives him the right to block anyone else from producing with that patent for 20 years. So he can just patent and then just let grass grow there. Say, yep, yeah, I'm not going to do anything, but you can't either. And so we thought, gosh, maybe what they were doing is being strategic and just patenting to block others from innovating in this space. And so we took a look at whether these energy firms were actually putting their money where their mouths were. And it turns out they are in a big way. So they are the, some, some of the largest investors worldwide in alternative energy projects. And that has to do with both the percentage of the wattage worldwide, and that's, that's alternative energy wattage, wind, solar, hydroelectric comes from these energy firms. And they've been some of the largest since the beginning. So I'll, I'll end by showing you the, one of these patents, one of the most important patents in solar technology. It was found by Exxon in 1978, right? Far before the term ESG even existed, they were motivated to do this, okay? And that we find absolutely zero evidence that they are trying to crowd anyone out here. Right? And taking a step back, and I'll kind of end with this, why? Why do we think this is going on? So this is that patent, so you can take a look. Well, I tell you, well, look, the reason we think this is going on is a very simple explanation. That is that these firms do not want to be your oil providers in 100 years. Right? In fact, as we know, BP is not British Petroleum. They rebranded themselves as Beyond Petroleum years ago. Right? They don't want to be your oil provider. They want to be your energy provider in 100 years. And they don't care whether that energy is oil or solar or wind or whatever else we come up with. They wanna be the leaders and the energy providers in that space. In order to do that, they need to innovate, right? From a survival perspective, they need to do it. So they are perfectly incentive aligned to be great innovators. And so what we find is evidence that largely backs that up. That look, they are really highly incented to do this and they're doing it. They're putting their money where their mouse is. So ending where Andrew began, we just want to shine a light on this space. That's our humble goal and say, hey, look everyone, it's a little bit weird for us to say ex ante, okay, these people can play and be part of the solution and these people can't. We're not even gonna let them, even if they have great ideas, we don't wanna hear them, we, they can't be part of the solution. Instead, a solution that has a reward based instead of punishment where it says, hey, look, anybody that can help us solve this really hard problem, how about you come and we'll reward you when you get the solution right. We think a solution like that will lead to the outcome that we all want much faster. And with that, I'll hand it over to Leslie. Okay, well, let's, uh, can, we, can we remove your, can we go back to um, Absolutely. Excellent. I, I just want to ask you one, one question, uh, and that is that your sample obviously was the energy companies on the one hand. On the other hand, it was a whole range of companies, many of which have absolutely bugger all to do with energy. Why should you assume that um, they should be as um, interested in alternative energy as the energy companies themselves, the fossil fuel companies themselves? Is that, is, are, you, are you comparing like with like here? Yeah, and so Andrew, that's a great question. And so we do within the paper, a, the exact test that you're talking about. We just look at and compare energy firms, right? Traditional energy versus new energy firms. And we find the same effect. And in fact, it's even a little bit larger. They're even a little bit more important in that sense. And the reason is that you have these other firms that have huge green motives. And so let me just show you, well, um, I won't share the screen again, but it turns out some of the largest producers of green innovation come from other industries that you might not be surprised by, like the automobile industry. So some of the largest are firms like Honda, firms like Ford, because they also need to innovate in this space because this green energy is going to be an important part of what they do. But to your point, even when we focus just on energy firms and energy provision firms, we see the exact same effects. The bad guys simply are better at this kind of business than the good guys. Can, yeah, can well, I, just... I don't know who the bad guys and good guys are. That's the point, is the guys, the traditional energy firms 
seem to be the innovators. They seem to be spending more of their innovative capacity on this, number one. And number two, they seem to be getting the best innovation. And that best innovation, to be clear, is not them saying that. So these are citations from outside organizations. So look at alternative energy firms. They are citing Exxon's patents far more than anyone else's patents. So this is, the Exxon has no control over that. That's their view that these, fir these firms are producing the best innovation. Okay, Jane has a couple of points on, on, she's, on the analysis itself. Yeah, I just wanted to ask a question about, you know, what does a green patent mean? And I noticed you say um, these, um, this research directly addresses climate change mitigation technologies related to energy gener generation, transmission or distribution. And I just wondered whether um, the, uh, um, some of the investment that um, oil companies are doing, whether it's in, in, in to reduce energy intensity per ton counts. So there's, you know, they might um, be, does it count that they're moving to, if you like, towards cleaner LNG or LPG versus other forms of gas or um, they're, as I say, the energy intensity is less, which is, um, many might think is all, is, is all well and good and helps with the transition, but the purists say, well, you know, LNG is still gas, is still fossil fuel, is still, you know, yeah, and so uh, what we use here, and what's nice is that the OECD has actually defined what these green patents are, and they have this classification system that I'm showing up on the screen now for this purpose. And within that, they have subcategories. I know it's a little bit hard to see, but they will say things like, okay, here's climate change mitigation technology. And then they say within that, there are lots of different ways you can try to mitigate climate change. So you can do that through wind energy, through solar, through water, and through different ways. And so we actually test across these different subcategories. It gets thinner for some of them than others. But to your exact question, absolutely carbon capture technology is in there, right? And to your point, that is an important part of the, our transition toward cleaner energy, right? There's not a single person in the world that says, hey, we should stop today using all forms of less clean energy. If we were to do that, global GDP would drop by like 60%. There'd be riots in the street. Like it'd be awful. Like none of our machines would work. Our homes would work. Like that would be terrible. No one is arguing that point. And so the, what's going to help us get there is both obviously the technology itself and ways to transition to that. And I can tell you that we have split our patents into both of those. So transition technologies, you could call them. And uh, I, we call them frontier technologies, but you can call them whatever you want. And so that are actual alternative sources of energy. And they are leaders in both of those spaces. Okay, Leslie, your, your response to this. Right, well, I guess I'd like to address the challenge in the paper, which, which was really around the merits or possibly the demerits of um, exclusion policies or divestment. Um, it, on, on the one hand, I think it's really timely, uh, this paper, and, and it's relevant because certainly within Europe, uh, we're seeing increased regulation in the space, you know, definitions around what is green and what isn't green. Um, and, you know, there is some, some problematic issues, I think, on, on some of that taxonomy. Um, so, so it is actually good, in a sense, to call out unintended consequences of ESG investing. And I, I, I genuinely do believe that um, exclusions policies, uh, divestment are sort of what I call the last resort. Um, but it's important that it's there. It's an important lever to have. You know, as an investor, it is your last port of call. You know, if the investment doesn't have the, the merits, even from a traditional perspective, as you talk about risk adjusted returns or more traditional financial metrics, you're not going to hold the, the, the security. So it's, I think, just as relevant in the ESG space. Um, so, so, so it's relevant, uh, this, this paper. Um, but I suppose from my perspective, just you know, as I was reading it, um, I was thinking more about the application and the relevance of um, having that, call it the stick, as opposed to the reward that, that you were sort of um, encouraging. You know, when you engage with a company, you, you are looking for change and you are looking for the company to identify those ESG issues and embrace them and, you know, set up a strategy to address them. 
Um, not all companies have been um, as responsive to that or as timely. Um, and you know, you you called out Exxon in terms of patents, and that's brilliant. Um, but in terms of their responsiveness on the engagement side, and I'm talking now 10 years ago, uh, I think potentially there's still a little bit of a laggard um, in my view from an ESG perspective, but they are sort of stepping up and, and acknowledging that um, they do need to have a much more credible transition plan. So, so I guess I'm saying I'm sympathetic, but as an investor, you do need to have that, um, that divestment approach and the, the board needs to understand uh, that when, when you're going there, particularly when you're doing um, collaborative engagement where you know, it's not just you know, Coots, we're, we're 30 billion of, of AUM, but when we go in there with, with bigger players, bigger asset managers, our voice is, is much louder and uh, frankly deserves to be heard. So when you go in with sort of that threat, I think it does make the, the conversation um, uh, more credible. So, so absolutely, I think it's, it's important. Um, I think also I, I ref, sort of talked about regulation in, in Europe and we are seeing, I think, almost a, um, a proliferation of exclusions policies. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the classification. Um, again, this is European regulation. I'm sure something similar will come to the US. Uh, in the UK, we're sort of waiting for the FCA to come out with, with again, something similar. But all regulation, you know, the, the intent is, is always right. Um, unfortunately, usually the language um, either oversteps or missteps. And, and, and I do think, um, you know, when it comes to sort of supporting the transition, it, it's a little bit unfortunate that, you know, the, the green definition is, is, is so narrow because our view is that the biggest impact here will be um, helping companies like Shell, like BP transition. And your point on patents is absolutely credible, right? I mean, these are big companies. Uh, they now under, understand the threat of their core business and they absolutely need to start funneling a lot more money into the, not just into the patents, but actually into uh, the, the, the evolution of those patents and the, and the development of the business lines to make it a bit more credible. So I guess I'm saying I agree, sort of, um, but equally, I genuinely think, um, particularly with um, the oil and gas sector, that you have some players that are, you can clearly see they want a transition, they've got a plan, they, there is a strategy in place and it is credible. And then you've got sort of the, the, the rest of them or the laggards um, that really need to start thinking about what is that credible strategy. And the patents I think are helpful. Um, they just need to start putting more R&D money into green as opposed to continuing, continually um, uh, putting more development uh, into the brown revenues. Can I just ask you, are you saying then that patents, though an interesting proxy for greenness, as yeah. it were, are not that good? Uh, you need something else and probably the total, total quantum of investment that's going into the green sector is a better measure than patents. I mean, I do think, yeah, you need to actually see it coming to fruition. I mean, a, a patent, exactly as, as Lauren um, identified, it's a right to do something. Um, I guess I'd like to see the doing something piece of it and not just the sort of initial work. I think the other interesting thing about patents is um, th this idea that they can be shared. I mean, you can keep the, the technology to yourself or you can share it. Um, and um, maybe not in oil and gas, but I know in other sectors, that's actually quite prevalent. So, so often it may not be the company that develops the patent that benefits. It may be that kind of whole industry where there's a sort of a follow through benefit. I, I think patents are important. Um, I know I was looking at some, some work that MSCI has done uh, on patents uh, and it actually it has a very similar kind of outcome to, to, to what Lauren's paper has identified. No, I mean, well, the, the key thing is capital spending. Um, so I, if you look at something Shell, for example, it spends about 20 billion a year capex, a huge amount, a small minority of that on renewables, and a larger amount actually on you know you know gas and oil. It's still doing a lot of ex conventional exploration and production. Now, obviously, a percentage of the capex going say to on gas is part of its transition plan, 
which it may or may not be getting much credit for. But nevertheless, there's still of that, you know, it, it, whether it's a majority, a huge amount of money still going into conventional, conventional EMP, which the campaigners would say means that's going to come on stream, be produced and keep pro emitting carbon for decades to come. So that's, that that's, a question or a statement. That's, why at, that's why they don't look at patents, they look at capex. Yeah, but, well, yeah. And, and if I can just sort of respond, because I, I agree with that, and I think it's the other point, which is sort of the, 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 the client demand or even call it the reputational risk um, as an asset manager uh, in investing in these companies is the positive story um, is often masked by that bigger share of revenues. Um, and, you know, even though I can see quite hopeful signs in a lot of these companies and, you know, do think um, a lot of them merit investment and you know, merit that sort of continuation and that development. Um, unfortunately, the front page of the newspaper will decide to go with the negative press and that's what makes it. It, it isn't necessarily the, the, the green uh, development and innovation uh, that makes it to the front, front of the page for a Shell or a BP. It will be more about what's going on in their um, traditional sort of oil and gas uh, business. All, all the protests. Lauren, you want to come in on this? Yeah, can I respond on this? And so, um, so first, I want I want to thank Leslie. So I, I think that was a very thoughtful response. And I want to touch on kind of three main points that she made. Okay, and I'm actually going to start at the end and kind of work the way back up. Um, and so the first is um, looking at evidence of them actually investing in this. So Leslie, I couldn't agree more. And so that's exactly what we did in the paper. And so I didn't present you the tables, but I talked about it a little bit. Here's the table. So we actually look, we say, we were worried about the exact same thing. Like I talked about that, hey, look, maybe they're just doing this to be strategic, right? Maybe these energy firms are just doing it to block other people out. They don't really want to invest in this. They just want to get some points on the board, but then have essentially like um, cheap talk, right? And so we looked at the actual amount that they were investing, and it turns out they are significant investors in alternative energy, right? They're actually putting their money where their mouths are here. And so this is not only on a wattage standpoint, because this is true, this is measuring the actual wattage worldwide that's produced by them, by these tr traditional energy firms right now, but also uh, from a CapEx standpoint, from a low carbon standpoint, and some of the largest projects in the world, right? So Denmark, for instance, has just uh, announced the largest wind energy product project that will ever happen is happening with Shell. So it's the government of Denmark and Shell that are gonna be pushing this forward. So they are important players in some of the largest and, and we need those projects, right? To understand scale, to understand wind at scale, they're the only ones who can do it. And so in that sense, they play an important role in the future, right? And so our, our whole paper is just saying, hey, look, maybe they're not gonna be the leaders of the alternative energy revolution. Like we don't know, no one can call who's going to be the next Tesla or Google or wherever it's gonna be. But our whole point is that they might have something that we wanna to listen to, right? They've been distributing energy for like a lot of years. And so the idea is even if they're not the ones who come up with it, maybe they can help us to distribute it efficiently, right? Maybe their pipes can be useful for us in getting these energy to people. And so our point is that they will likely play some role, or at least listening to them on some part of this is pretty important. And, and to, to this point and this important question, they seem to agree with that too, and that they're investing, right? And that they are doing that good work for us to try to figure out whether we can do some of these big projects at scale. And so that's this kind of first point. And the second point, which I think is another very good point, um, is the role of engagement. So what you said, Leslie, is that we need divestment as a tool for engagement. And so look, I couldn't agree with you more on engagement. I would just argue that we might have other tools we can use for engagement too. And in particular, we can look to capital markets for how we've tried to engage firms in the past, right? And so this idea that, hey, if we just sell all the firm shares, right, then they're gonna listen to us. When we're not shareholders anymore, we're just like people like screaming from the outside, like with our signs, like, uh, there are other ways that we try to do it. And so if we see markets, the way that the private markets have worked on this, they become activist investors. What do activist investors do? Who are the exact ones who try to change what a company does? Who goes in and says, God, Heinz is totally messed up. They're like totally screwing up now. We need to go in and make changes. They do the opposite, right? They load up on shares, they get board seats, and then they change it from the inside. And so 
just empirically, as we've seen companies change and do wholesale shifts, the way we've gotten companies to shift their strategies, if we want to, right? Which I agree, you could make an argument that we want some of these companies to, and to your point, it's not that they're not changing, they're not changing as, as quickly as we want them to, right? If we want them to change faster, I totally agree with your idea of engagement. I just think maybe a different way to do that Right, that's been shown in other contexts, is that we actually buy shares and then we engage as activist investors. Right, We go in and we say, hey, we own 10%. This is our company. Shell is ours now. Okay, And so we are going to make Shell into the Shell we want it to be. And I would argue that's a more powerful tool than going down to zero. And I would add, add, wait, Leslie, I and I would love to hear your point on this. Hold on. Well, um, well, just hang on. Jane, this is also very much Jane's area, divestment against engagement. Uh, I want to, yes, because one, one thing... Um, and wait, can I, can I just add one wrinkle to that divest and investigate it? And this is um, from, a, I'm actually writing a Harvard Business School case on a firm that's doing this at the point. Look, nothing magic in finance happens at the zero weight, which is to say, if you think 10% is a uh, weight that's too high, so you take it down to zero, you don't need to stop at zero. You can go minus 10, minus 20, minus 30. So if you think divestment is the right idea, why divest? Why'd you stop at zero? Zero is just a random number, just like one or minus one or something else. So if you think divestment is the right idea, then in fact, maybe minus 20% would be even better, right? You should short it or minus 40. And so I would love to hear Jane and Leslie, your takes on that. Like we should see far more shorting campaigns, right? Forget about divestment. If divestment is the goal, then minus 40 is even more hardcore. And we should be doing that. I, I just sort of agree with you that there's not enough short selling around because uh, it's so much more difficult to uh, make, you know, money in the in the time allowed out of it, um, even though there's just- well, these, well, But these, Jane, to that point, look, I also am, uh, I have uh, research on this and I've, I've uh, approached and, and worked with some regulators on it. These stocks, BP, Shell, RD, these are some of the largest and easiest to short stocks there are. So you don't have to worry about rebate rates or spreads or recalls or things like this. Like you could actually take, these are like GCs, that general collateral stocks. Yeah. Like you could short these and hold these for like six months, a but year. Let's, let's, let's get back because I mean, you know, we could have a whole discussion on short, short selling alone. Um, the, uh, on, I just wondered what Leslie thought about this as well. I think I'm just wondering whether you slightly exaggerate the, policy of ESG funds as it, it, the impression comes over that um, you know divestment and serious underweighting is really is the sort of common policy I'm not sure it is this is you know I actually think if you think about actually if you think about the passive investing um, which at, where actually um, you, you, you're not underweighting and overweighting you're just in there you 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 can't quietly sell and go away you certainly can't short uh, all you can do is be active and engage. And so I, I just think um, that not, people don't realize to what extent um, it's, you know, engagement is, is actually what's happening rather than the sort of divestment and, and serious underweighting that you're talking about. Leslie. Yeah, no, and no, I, I actually agree. I mean, uh, some of our investments are in a sense passive or sort of aligned with an index. And that is the the only lever that we have is, is actually engagement. The the ability to divest is is just not within our, our remit because we're tracking something that's that's predefined. Um, so so yeah, I mean it is uh, as I said earlier for me it's the it's the first port of call. Um, but you know if I so you know and let, let me talk openly we we have a an exclusions policy. It is it's about a spectrum, right? And when we put something on that list and we think long and hard before we put something on, on a sort of an exclusions list, but it, it tends to be activities that we have already kind of decided um, it, it, it isn't a sustainable activity. So, you know, thermal coal extraction, um, you know, there's just so much evidence that, um, that this is sort of one of the, the primary drivers of CO2 emissions, um, scientists globally, um, are basically saying, you know, this has to be in, in wind down in order for, for, for us to meet two degrees. So, you know, it, it, isn't a, it is a blunt instrument, but uh, we try to be as, as thoughtful about it as possible when we employ it, uh, because once it's there, you know, your voice is gone in a sense, right? You've just decided not to invest, but there has to be a rationale behind it. And it does need to be linked, at least in my view, um, with sort of uh, future financial performance. How do, how do you feel it is used in the United States, Leslie, uh, Lauren? And so let, I wanna say two things. So, uh, so number one, Leslie, um, 
I think that's a great point. And we're not saying that you wouldn't want to divest from any firm, right? We're saying something I think that's much more modest, which is just that, hey, innovation hasn't been used. It hasn't been looked at and innovation's got to be part of the solution. And so I agree with you. Look, there are some types of fuels and some types of extraction that like you can't innovate your way out of, right? We just can't use them anymore. We're saying, hey, let's look at the players that are innovating, that are trying to come up with innovative solutions, and maybe they can be part of the solution going forward. And maybe we shouldn't just have these blanket restrictions against them based on other things that don't take that into account. And to your point, Andrew, we do exactly this. So to Jane's point, look, rather than looking at one fund or two funds, here's the universe of investment by ESG. This is, and I want to be clear about this. These are ESG funds, mutual funds, okay? So these are not divestiture campaigns. These are ESG mutual funds. And the empirical fact is that they do significantly underweight energy firms, okay? They do. And they both significantly underweight them as a universe, and they're significantly less likely to just hold them at all, right? To, or in other words, significantly more likely to have a zero weighting. Them. And so that is the, that's the universe response in terms of ESG funds and how ESG scores are used. Jane. And so ESG rating is, is used and it's used in that way. Jane. Um, well, I'm not, I'm not sure I wanted to add anything more on that, um, that partic particular point. And, and, and so can I, Andrew, can I then take, uh, there's, so there's one last point of Leslie's that I wanna get to. And so one other thing that she said was that intent is always right, right? Intent is always right. And so, um, look, I, I, I mean, I, of course, she didn't mean intent is always right, right? There could be really bad policies, but she means even when intent is right, right, then like implementation can be a huge uh, shortfall. And on this point, I couldn't agree with her more. And so like, we have seen intents of governments over every crisis that's been faced, like all of the governments have the best interests of their constituents in mind, right? Like none of them, no one thinks they're like nefarious or trying to do that. Like they're all trying, but they all have different solutions. Some of those solutions are better than others, right? And so all we're saying is that we totally agree that the intent is right across all these places. And we're just want to bring a new voice into that that says, hey, innovation, given that it's got to be part of the solution, right? If we already had all the tools we needed and it was just an implementation, right? It's like, hey, we already have everything. It's just these guys are using the bad tools. These guys are using the good tools. We just need everyone to use the good tools. Like that would be a totally different story than this. This is, we're not there yet. We actually don't have the tools. We may not even be able to imagine what those tools will be that will get us there. And so innovation is an important part of anyone's solution. And given that, the fact that we're not taking that into account when we think about who's getting capital today, we think is an oversight and we think it's one that can be corrected. And that's the real bottom line of our paper. And to this last point, we think this is a way that intent can match implementation in a better way. Okay, what's happening over time series? I mean, the, the, presumably you have data over quite a long period. What's the, what, what are the trends in the data? Is this situation getting worse as, as far as you're concerned? Or how does it go? Yeah, and so here's what, what's interesting about this. So look, I'll tell you this. I mean, ESG investing has not been around that long, right? And so it, not that long in a big time series sense, right? So think like 15-ish years, and it's really heated up in the last five, to be honest, when you look at it from an AUM perspective. Um, and so um, what's kind of cool about that for us is that one might argue, and we kind of thought that like, hey, maybe the only reason why these energy firms are investing in this is because of the stick of ESG investing, right? Like the penalty of ESG investing is lighting a fire under them and they're responding by doing all this awesome stuff. And so that would be true and we could test that. And we actually can test that in the sense that, and I'll just go back to that patent from 1978. In 1978, if you said ESG investing, no one would have any idea what you're talking about. It could be like RFP investing, ABC, investing. like what are you talking about ESG? It wasn't even a term that existed. And so we have pre-ESG innovation investment by the green, by traditional energy and other firms. And they were large investors starting at even 1980, okay? So energy firms, traditional energy firms saw this early and have been important innovators in this space going all the way back then. And so Andrew, to your point, they have been innovators in green energy far before anyone else and far before there were ESG ratings. When so it you, does when you not look like ESG ratings in particular 
are the singular driver of why they're doing this. And again, why do I think they're doing this? Well, I think it aligns with what everyone would think is, look, they want to be around 100 years. They want to be around 200 years. And they understand that energy is going to be a different space 50 years from now than it will be than it is today. Is that, is that true of coal as well as of oil? What, if you did, I assume you looked at Peabody Coal and other coal companies and so on. Did they innovate? Did they, and it was, so yeah, and so we haven't looked at the specific firm names within coal. We can do that, but this gets to Leslie's point that there may be some of these firms that just simply can't do it, right? Or they they have a technology or they have, a, in that case, an energy source that can't be innovated out of the dirtiness of its use. Yeah, and I think, I was gonna say, just on coal, I think maybe five years, maybe a bit longer, you sort of had this sort of space within coal, sort of greener coal and, and browner coal, if I just sort of use very simple terms. Um, and I think that was the point, right? Because, I mean, coal is used extensively in, in emerging markets. And, you know, there's a, there's a whole point on this transition about the just transition. And I do think it's important to, to understand that we can't just turn the, 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 the taps off. Um, so coal is still something that's used um, quite prevalently, um, as I said, in emerging markets. And I think there, in, in some cases, not all, they are looking to, in a sense, minimize um, the polluting element of it. But to what degree, you know, is, is the real question. Well, what I'm asking really is 20 years ago, when, when you see that the oil companies were starting to think about a future beyond oil, look at the coal companies, they were not affected by ESG issues at that time. But there was sulfur scrubbers, there was a transition to other forms of coal. Were they also looking at a future beyond coal? Or were they just stuck with the idea that they were going to take it out of the ground and then die? Yeah, yeah, and my guess is that there were varied strategies taken, and the more forward-looking ones probably tried to transition to other forms, and the uh, and the others did not. Uh, we haven't looked. I can't empirically tell you. We haven't looked at exactly that. It's a good suggestion. We should definitely take a look and see and see what the markers are of the firms that were more forward-looking, mm -hmm. and try to, like you and Leslie are suggesting, come up with more transition-type innovations that will help us get there more clean. In other words these types of technologies will actually reduce the climate impact of this transition that we all see and kind of know has to happen. And that's a real positive impact, right? And so yeah. the ones, there were certain of these firms that were making that and certain that were not. And no, if, if I can just, can I just add, um, just made me think about Anglo-American and of course recently they've um, carved out their sort of coal business because obviously, um, they were getting quite a bit of challenge from the investment community around their so that, that, the, the coal business. So um, it is interesting, you know, on the one hand, as, a, as an investor, you kind of go, oh, oh look, good, they, they, they're actually addressing the issue, they're divesting from this business. But, you know, they're not, they're carving it out, they're monetizing it, and it will continue to pollute. So, you know, there are, <laughs> these are really difficult um, uh, problems to solve, right? Uh, as a business, you know, you are trying to maximize your bottom line, um, but to the detriment of the planet. And what's what's happened with some, if, if the um, pressure from investments, you know, leads these multinational companies to, to sell off their coal, coal yeah. businesses, then they're selling them off to someone who's in a jurisdiction that couldn't care less. Exactly. And, so, and the coal mine sails on. So, you know, it, divestment even if the um, investment pressure cleans up the investment portfolio it doesn't necessarily clean up the planet yeah and so the, and, and, and jane i think you make a very important point there which i i agree i think is another uh, uh stake in the heart of divestment even if many investors divest as long as you have one investor that's willing to take this on and has the capital and in this case you have many investors divestment doesn't do anything right because divestment all it is is a change of shareholding amongst people, right? Or amongst investors. So if you have some investors who are more than happy to take those shares and then even we can juice it up because I'll put a 2% or 3% discount. So I'll build in that appreciation already. Then like it's business as usual. And so divestment, even as a tool in its own is a pretty blunt tool as opposed yeah. to engagement and other things that can get to these outcomes more quickly. Okay, yeah. what kind of a response have you had to your paper? And so um, we have, look, it, uh, 
And so I'll, I'll say this in two ways, Andrew. So we've had a, a, a positive response from those we've talked to. So it just an article just came out in Forbes today about our paper. And so we've had a number of regulators from across the world and firms, and, and uh, I'll call them, just call them regulatory bodies. So governments and other regulatory bodies that have called us and engaged with us to try to think about this more. And I think that's been a really positive response. And that's what we've wanted, right? We just want to shine the light on this and get this, these facts and these ideas into the conversation. And from there, I think just a better conversation can be had. And that's really our humble goal. And we seem to be achieving that goal thus far. I think there's more to do, but I think we're well on our way. And the investment community? Um, and the investment community has uh, viewed this, look, and that's where the second part of my response is. Um, we have heard from a selected group there, okay? And so most of the ones we've heard from have said, oh, the, we've known this all along. This is what we thought. This is what we agree with. But I'm fully aware that the, those are the comments that we're going to receive, right? And the selected ones that are going to come through. And well, so in that sense, I've received, a, a, you know, a, a, probably a biased distribution of the comments, but those have been positive as well. And, and Leslie, what, how do you think this kind of, this kind of a research goes down in the UK? Yeah, listen, I, I, I still think it's, it's, it's very valuable research, right? Um, I know, it, it, you know, in the UK and, and in Europe, we're um, a little bit further progressed from an ESG perspective than, than the US, although admittedly, they're now finally moving at a pace. Thank you. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I mean, this is, this is right. I mean, the, the, the solutions that we're looking for uh, from climate change, they do have to come from these bigger companies with the, the deeper pockets and with the expertise. Um, so I actually do agree with, with um, the, the, the focus of the paper and that actually as an investor, you need to be selective. And, and that's, that's, the, that's the case, regardless of whether you're looking at ESG or, or other financial factors, you need to be selective. You need to know who you're investing in and you need to know why. Um, but I do think patents is a is, is a, a good indicator to look at uh, in terms of of that future innovation and, and potentially for growth in companies. But and, you also need Andrew, to, can I add? Oh, I mean, can I ask what how the rate yeah. the the raters view your your research? Because yeah, so I, I, I'm going to move there. And so that's a that's a great point. So actually, I want to show you one other thing on that because that's quite important. Um, but first, uh, so on the firm side also, I forgot to mention, we have been chatting with some firms. So BP, for instance, reached out to us. And so we talked to some of the, the highest members of their executive team, and they're clearly quite worried about this, right? Both how the market views them and how the world and regulators view them in light of this. And so we've also been engaging with conversations with them, and I say really positive conversations about thinking through this, thinking through their innovation policies and what that means for the firm and looking forward. But now getting to your point about ESG raters, I think this is a huge issue. And Leslie touched upon this, that needs to be solved. Okay, and by solved, I mean, look, I think the, the enthusiasm for investing based on ESG far outstrips our understanding of what good ESG investing is. And I'll give you one piece of evidence and I'll kind of end with this of exactly that. Here it's what I'm sure I'll just show you the graph from the paper. And so this is the correlation. And so maybe a little hard to hear, but th these are the correlation of ESG ratings across ESG raters, right? Which is to say, think of like Morningstar, uh, think uh, Sustainalytics, who we use in the paper, S&P and these others. And so this is their correlation. And what you can see, maybe a little bit hard to see through these numbers, but these are far lower than one, right? Ideally, we'd like them to all agree. Oh yeah, yeah, this firm definitely super high ESG rating, this firm not a great ESG rating. It turns out they actually disagree all the time, all the time, but it's worse than that. When asked about this, right, they said, oh, won't it be great when you guys all, when we converge to the same ESG rating and then we can put investors on the right path. They stopped this question asker during the conference. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's not clear to us that's optimal. If we all agree, then we don't have a business, right? Like they don't all have businesses. The second that they all agree on this, you don't need Sustainalytics ESG rating and Morningstar's ESG rating and S&Ps. And so they actually have an incentive to have different ratings and to keep it optimally different over time. That's great for them. That's not great for us. And I want to point out one thing. 
on the environmental pillar. You might say, oh yeah, but there's differences between E, S, and G. G is really tough to figure out. S may be also tough to figure out, social impact. But E, we can probably agree on, right? Here's the fascinating part. If you look at E, environmental pillar for energy, this is the energy industry, there's actually less agreement about the E pillar, about energy ratings amongst firms than there is amongst the social piece, right? That was staggering to us, that there's more agreement about this. There's still not much agreement about social, but they agree more on the social piece than they do on energy, where we can measure things like carbon footprint and these other measures like innovation, which they're not taking into account, by the way. But I think that's a huge problem, Andrew, and one really to end on that we need, even if investors are totally right and they're excited and they want to put their capital toward it, they need direction and they don't have that right now. Okay, the final word is with you, Jane. Are you convinced? You, uh, <laughs> Jane Ajudad was the financial editor at the FT. She has 20 years experience of this. Um, I, I think this is, it. I think this is very, these are very important points. Um, and, that I think it's a very useful corrective to the idea that a sort of stereotype of uh, big oil or big, big fossil fuel, that they're stuck in the past, that they make so much money out of this stuff that they don't, you know, they might pay lip service to you know, research and development um, capex on renewables, but yeah, they're really, so I think this is a very, this is an important corrective. I, I think that um, you're, you're gonna struggle a bit to get people to look as closely at patents as they do at capex. Um, and um, I think the other thing is that I think that it's um, also very important to point out the disadvantages of, a, of divestment, although as Leslie says, you have to have this in your toolkit ultimately. Um, but I also think that we, we've had a very rational discussion today about transition. I actually find it quite difficult to have a rational discussion in some of our other forums about transition, because actually there are, you know, there are people who just think, you know, fossil fuel is fossil fuel and the sooner it, people stop using it and no more carbon emissions from it, the better. You know, the, the, the point made about uh, duh, the economy is stupid, you know, doesn't get through because this is really a, quite a political and a campaign infused area. So I think it's important work. I wish you well with it. I hope that they don't just, you know, say, oh, you know, as the just look, people don't just look out for some sort of funding from big oil for your research and that it really is, you know, taken as seriously as it, as it should be. And good luck with it. And the other, you have an important corrective that's in there, but which we haven't really gone on, is that you're just reminding us that there's been a happy coincidence, possibly, in the short history that you can do well by doing good. And so the thing you say right up front, which is that it originally, and then, you know, theoretically, people should be prepared, investors should be prepared to accept a discount or pay a bit more for this stuff, that hasn't come home to roost. But I think your research and other research like it will say, hang on a minute, you know, there could be a different phase of the cycle in this. On that point, can I thank Lauren, Lauren Cohen, can I thank Leslie, Leslie Gent, can I, my colleague Jane Fuller, and of course, all of you for watching. Many thanks.